everyone, and welcome to Dream Leapers with Harriet Cole. I want you to know I'm very excited to talk to a wonderful guest today who has written a book that is just got all kinds of incredible information about what is possible. What is possible in life if you dream big, if you work hard, if you live in a world of tremendous support, supportive family, the vision of your spouse and your own vision. The woman who we're gonna be talking to today is named Lloyda Lewis. She is a businesswoman, a philanthropist, an author, and a lawyer by profession. She was admitted to practice law in both the Philippines and in New York, and she became the first Filipino woman to pass the New York bar exam without studying in the United States. Lloyda's latest book, Why Should Guys Have All the Fun?, is debuting on March 28th, and she's here to discuss it with us today. I'm so happy to welcome Lloyda Lewis. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Harriet. Oh, and I thank Marilyn Crawford for putting us together. Yes, yes. When Marilyn called, I said, yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, Lloyda, you, I, well, I'm from Baltimore. So <laughs> we have lots of connections oh, together. But yes, yes. My, you know, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Yes. Lewis was born, raised, and studied high school in Baltimore, and his family is still there. Yes. And so just to give you some background, uh, all of the people who are gathered with us today, Mr. Reginald Lewis, Mr. Reginald F. Lewis was Miss Lloyda Lewis's husband. He is known as the first black billionaire, I believe in the United States. He was an incredible businessman and what he's best known for is acquiring Beatrice Foods. But he did a lot of acquisitions leading up to Beatrice Foods. He and, and he had the first black law firm on Wall Street. Is that correct? That's correct. And all of this that Harriet is talking to you about is in his book, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? A yes. Who has created a billion dollar business empire. So. Which is which is absolutely amazing. And so you know how that, that saying about behind every good man, there's an incredible woman? Enter Miss Lloyda Lewis. And what I love about your book, because of course I've known about you over the years and our paths have intersected at different points, but reading your book shared so much that I think people may not know. I'd like for you to share a little bit about what it meant for you to grow up in the Philippines in a really dynamic family. Can you tell us a little bit? I'm going to venture to say that not that many people know about life in the Philippines. Can you tell us about your early days? Well, my father, and he has a great influence on me, became an orphan. His father died when he was young. And so he lived with a rich uncle who was very entrepreneurial, had a movie house, had a trucking business. And when he, in his mind, when I grow up, I will be a businessman like him. And so being poor, he had an equal, egalitarian attitude with so many with people, dealing with people. And so as I grew up in Sorsogon, a town in the Philippines, we grew up comfortable because my father then was very successful. But it was never a time where he identified people according to the color of their skin, according to their physical size. It, he had always a, a heart for people who are downtrodden, who are underserved, who are poor. And so, but my mother was very strict. So she gave us a good education by insisting that we go to a Catholic uh, high school. And that's where I came from for high school, another town. And, you know, that, that gave me the foundation of faith, to believe in God, to know that God loves me and that, you know, whatever happens to me, God is with me. So that's my background. Wow. Yeah. A lot of, a lot in what you just shared. In, in your book, you talk a lot about your faith. And it's very clear that faith has been the bedrock for you in all situations. This began when you were a child. Yes, my father and mother. My father was a uh, donor to the cathedral. He provided the gravel and sand because he was also, aside from having a movie house named after me, by the way, 
because in his mind, I'm going to run for public office so that, you know, growing up with Loida Theater, when I run for public office, I already have name recognition. So he was, <laughs> he was very close to the church, to the parish priest. And um, my mother was head of the Catholic Women's League. But being in high school as an intern for six years, guided by Bel um, German nuns, very strict, but very, very well rooted in the spirit of St. Benedict. They were Benedictine nuns. Ora et labora, pray and work. And I add, have a little fun. <laughs> and at one point, you thought of becoming a nun. <laughs> and clearly that is not the path you chose, but talk about that time in your life when you, you had that calling and you believed that to be a nun was, would be your path. Well, growing up, I mean, being in a, in a, an intern, seeing how these German nuns left their country to go to the Philippines, teach, you know, children in uh, of another country, service. And, and they were happy. So in my mind, what a wonderful life that is. A life dedicated to serving people, loving God. Hey, that's, that's a good life for me. So when I was in second year college, I mean law school, because my father wanted me to be a lawyer, I thought of becoming a nun. And I already had a date, July 4. But as mother superior, when I told her I can't go in, I, I, you know, I had to, my mother advised me, finish for law school, take the bar and then enter. Why? Because then my merchandise is in my head. I don't have to be a dependent, dependent on anybody else. So that's why my first inclination was to be a nun, a life of service. And in many ways, while you did not become a, a nun, you have led a life of service. Uh, so that that service runs through your story very clearly in, in your book. How did you meet your husband? How did you meet Reginald F. Lewis? Reginald Francis Lewis. Well, I came, my mother and I came in September in New York, where my, my sister was studying at Columbia University. And our idea was stay with her and then when she graduates in May, we will tour to Europe and then back to the Philippines and I'll start my career. But September to May is too long. You can only see so many Broadway shows. You can only shop so many times. So I thought I better work. And so at, there was an ad at the Village Voice, Law Students Research, Law Students Civil Rights Research Council. Oh, civil rights. I like that. And instead of saying in my resume, I'm a lawyer, I said, I'm a second year law student. And I guess I did well. So my boss, who was a Harvard graduate, classmate of Reginald Lewis, took me in. I had a job immediately. And when I introduced my sister to him, he was fast. They were going out on a date. And that Friday, he said, Loida, why don't we do a double date? Uh, I'll, I'll fix you a blind date. And that's how I met. Reginald Lewis on a blind date. <laughs> that is, that's like one of those storybook romances, the way that that begins, that your sister is there and, and on this double date. And you all clicked right away, didn't you? Yes. Our first, uh, our first meeting was um, going to this soul food restaurant called West Bundocks. And whatever he had to say, I had something to add. And I, whatever I have to say, he had something to add. I mean, we talked nonstop. But there is one thing, though, that really sort of like clicked it. When I was talking about him being an African-American, he immediately quashed that subject. He said, I'm international. Meaning to say, don't talk to me as a black man. I'm international. And sure enough, 20 years later, in 1987, he bought on a leverage buyout for almost $1 billion dollars. Beatrice International Food, 64 companies in 31 countries. He was international. He sure was international. You know, one of the things that you write about in your book and that he, and he in his, the, the issue of race in America certainly 
is different from what it was like in the Philippines. And and you mentioned earlier that your father didn't see color. He he saw everyone as equal and he really paid attention to people who were in need. Reginald Lewis had to face the racism that you experience as a black man in America because he was a black man in America. You can't really escape that. Even though he was international and he set his vision further than that, you describe in the book some moments when it he really comes up against racism and it's tough for him to accept. Can you describe one of those moments for us? Oh, over and over, you know, he knew. He just didn't want to be pigeonholed. Because you're black, you cannot do this. Because you're black, you cannot do that. So that was the concept. Okay, don't pigeonhole me just because I'm a black man. But being black, he you know, he always said after studying at Harvard, where in order to create wealth, his term paper where he got an honors grade, in order to create wealth, do merger and acquisition. Because he tells me, if you start a company, 90% fail of startups. And so in his mind, he will always be buying a company and that's the way to great wealth. Because even as a lawyer, we were very comfortable. And so Mr. Lewis had bought first company, failed, tried to buy a second company, failed. And the third company, he was going to buy it and the man was going to work for him. And the man didn't want to work for a black man. So he broke it at the day of closing. So that's just one. But there are many instances because, you know, I understood when he comes home and he would be angry with, with this, just a slight moment. And then I understood he was letting off steam because in the workplace, discrimination and racism and bigotry is so present. In fact, when he bought a, a drawing of a black man on a vice, he said, I, I often feel just like him. So racism was alive and well, but I, this is what I wanted people to know. What, that's why I wanted the book finished because he didn't finish it. He died in five years after buying Beatrice. That no matter what, don't let people pigeonhole you. And if you have a dream, just go after it. And don't, you know, go after it. Keep going no matter what. And that's Mr. Lewis. And that is definitely Mr. Lewis. And Mrs. Loida Lewis has written a book. It is called, Why Should White Guys? No, that's your husband's book. <laughs> your book is, what's the name of your book? Why Should Guys Have All the Fun? Yes, Why Should it's Guys Have All the Fun? It's an American story of love. Yes. Motherhood, because we have two girls, and running a billion dollar empire. That's beautiful. And I'd love for you to say, tell us the title of your book again, please. Yes, please. Uh, it's it's going to be released March 28th. Why should guys have all the fun? An Asian American story of love, marriage, motherhood, and running a billion dollar empire. Woohoo! And don't you want a copy? I know you do. I've read every single page. It is beautifully written. The stories are so vividly shared and you learn a lot. I learned a whole lot about business and about compassion. You know, that that as, as um, Ms. Lewis said, it's all right there in the book. Please pre-order the book at Amazon.com. Yes. Just search Why Should Guys Have All the Fun? And it's $28. That would be yes. helpful to me. Yes. I want to, sell, I want to pre-sell pre -sell yes. before March 28th. But thank you, Harriet, for allowing me this commercial interruption. Oh, no. We're, we want So pre-sales, you know, as, as an author myself, I can tell you, pre-sales are everything. So ordering the book in advance makes a huge difference to authors because it proves to the publisher that you have an audience who wants to buy your book. And it, even as the stories are rich and very important, you need people to read those stories and to get the word out. So we, we're doing this broadcast early so that we can, let, we can encourage people to uh, get this book immediately. So thank you. We're, we're happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll sign it. I just sign it. Wonderful. And so I, I want to go back to the early days because, you know, your husband's story is almost like the too good to be true story. I mean, the story of growing up in Baltimore and becoming 
the uh, owner of this company that was built to be a billion dollar business, which is simply amazing. But it took a tremendous amount of hard work. And the two of you together, you didn't start out rich. You started out modestly, right? And and had to build. You talk about living in a small apartment, a five-story walk-up. <laughs> That's not no piece of cake. A five-story walk-up is something else. So in those early days, what was it like for you building a life with your husband and you know, believing that great things are going to happen, but but you were struggling as a young couple, just having a regular life. Talk about that a little bit. Well, he had a job with uh, Paul Weiss, you know, a blue shoe corporate life. While I said, I will work for the poor at the Manhattan Legal Services. So we divided our expenses. He'll take care of the big ones, paying the mortgage, paying vacations, and I will take care of household, which is buying groceries. And that's from my salary. However, when, you know, I never could make my checkbook um, balance. So I would issue a check to the butcher, issue a check to them, and then it would bounce. And they'll call me, Mrs. Lewis, your check. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> At a certain time, I had this thick of, uh, of return check. That was how hard it is. But I never lost faith. I knew my husband would be good. And I did what I could, which is, all right, I'll return it. I'll pay you cash. So what I'm saying is that everyone has a beginning. That's, you know, hard. But just push on. Because if you, you, if you are together, look, you get married. Why are you going to compete? Are you nuts? You're a team. So you work together. And so after that, Mr. Lewis slowly built his law practice for 10 years. And then this, the, the chance came to buy McCall Pattern Company. That's the first right. successful re leverage buyout. So the beginning was hard. And then that's, that's the financial. The most difficult part was Mr. Lewis' temper. Oh, my yes. God. Yes, you talk so, about that. that. Yes, yes, yes. At the beginning, I couldn't stand it. You know, the F-U-C-K and the S-H-I-T and the M-F. Oh, my God. So I really had to call his mother because I cannot call my mother. I call his mother, Mom, Mom, I can't stand it anymore. And Mom is so good. I call her Mom. She's the mother of Mr. Lewis. She's not mother-in-law because that has a bad connotation. I call her mother-in-love. Mm -hmm. Mom, Mom, I, I can't. I, what, what do I... I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't be with him too long. And I said, Loida, Loida, now wait, wait, wait. Loida, you know he loves you. Why don't you go to the toilet, spit on it, flush it, and you'll feel better. Isn't that so good? I did. And I felt better. That is that is so good. And you, you know what? In in marriage, in in life, there they're all different facets of what life is like. And it's what you describe, I think, beautifully in your book is showing that there's not one side. So he was driven for sure, but he did have a hot temper. And as we know, whatever steam you have to let off, it often happens at home. And you had to kind of figure that out. Now I want I want to share, you know, just and share my condolences. Mom recently passed away. How old was she? And tell us a little bit more about her. Yes, mom was 70, 90, 97 years old, yes. but she lived a full life. There was Mr. Lewis. He, 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 I think part of his psyche was when his mother left his father when he was five years old and brought it back to the grandparents, Mrs. Fugit's mother and father, Sam and Sevilla Cooper. Mm -hmm. And the first thing when he came in with Reginald, five years old, his grandfather started cursing, bleep, 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 another mouth to feed. And then his, he heard his mom say, don't worry, dad, we pay our way. So first lesson, when he woke up in the morning, where's mommy? Mommy was out looking for a job and she worked all the time. So that's the first lesson as he was growing up. Pay your way, be responsible for yourself. Don't depend on anybody, maybe depend on your parents, but basically be responsible for yourself. That's mom. That, no, second one. Second yeah. lesson. Second yeah. lesson. For me, Miss, Mrs. Fugit is always so practical. 
because when we when I had my daughter Leslie, she came and stayed with me until I was you know able to take care of myself. Second daughter Christina, she came again from Baltimore and stayed with me. And the most really, really, really helpful to me was when Mr. Lewis died after a short illness of brain cancer. I was catatonic. I was totally out of it. And mom stayed with me until I was able to get hold of myself. That's how generous she is. And her husband, Butch, Jean Fugit, senior, you know, to allow her to be away from home just to take care of me because I was out of sorts. That's the kind of woman Mrs. Fugit was. And uh, just thinking about her being gone, you know, helps. I mean, it's very hard, but I know that she is free because in the last moments of her life, you know, she she could not remember things because of dementia. She could not see care very well. She could not hear very well. She needs a hearing aid. She could not walk very well. She needs a walker. And so she told herself, enough already, I'm going. So I talked to her Monday and she was gone Tuesday. You wow. know, so she decided her own. That's the kind of woman she was. And you stayed close to her for all of the years that you were connected to her. That's beautiful. Yes, yes. She is my mom, my second mother. You know, mom, mom, mama was in Manila and she is Filipina. So she doesn't really know what is United States, living life in the United States, living life with Reginald Lewis. But his mother knew him. And so she was my foil. She was my, what do you call this now? Sounding board whenever yes. I feel. She has a PhD in human relations. She knew exactly <laughs> what to do. My two daughters, you know, with employees, you know, she was she was just tops, formidable woman. Well, and I know just it it's interesting that just as your book is about to launch is when she left the world, when I saw in the news that she had passed. It just felt like all the support she could probably possibly give you and the family she had given. And here's a new launch for you as she moves on. Yes, you know. I think she said, I've done my bit. I've done my best. Okay, Her, Mr. Lewis, although he, he died early at 50 years old, uh, you know, reached the very height of corporate America. Yes. Jean, Jean Fugit is a lawyer. Okay. Another lawyer is Sharon Fugit. Uh, a PhD in education is Rosalind Fugit Wiley, Dr. Wiley. And Joey was an actor. He has a master's in performing arts. And Tony, Tony finished college, but worked for 10 years at IBM. So as far as mom was concerned, they all had second degrees. And that's based on her salary as a postal worker and her husband's salary as a federal worker. So they worked it out and sent six children to do must, you know, second, I mean, master's. What right. Postgraduate. Postgraduate. That is phenomenal. You know, I want to share that your husband certainly did a Herculean thing in the leverage buyouts and ultimately buying and building Beatrice Foods. And very tragically, he left this earth early. He got ill, as you mentioned, had a short illness and passed away. You took over. You took over. And one of the things that you talk about in this book is the conversations that you had as your husband was building way before the leverage bios, building his law practice. Just every evening when you all would talk about business and strategy, he really trusted you and you trusted each other in, in batting these ideas back and forth. Can you talk about that relationship that you had that really helped to teach you about business? Okay. Well, don't, don't I don't want anyone to have any uh, wrong idea that I gave Mr. Lewis his vision. He had a vision. He had integrity. He had the hard work. And he had the determination. So he was ready-made already when I met him. That's why I fell in love with him. But yes. what? Uh, then I, I, I knew that my part is just to be his 
what do you call it now? Cheerleader. Because, yes. you know, the, our men, our strong men, are always getting slapped here and there. So when they come home, they don't want to have a dragon in the house. Why have you been? Why are you late? No. Darling, have you eaten? Okay. Do you want a massage? You know? So my role as his wife is to support him and give him the love and uh, and cherish him and build him up so that when he comes home and he said, oh, my God, he said something so bad. So rather than me, yeah, that was stupid. No, I would say he deserves it. Don't worry about it. That's what he should have done because it happened already. So I was support. I, I, I consider myself the canvas where he can paint his masterpiece. Right. Mm. So that's my role as his wife. But then when he died, I, it took me six months before I could say, they will be done. I could not say they are father. And as I told you, Mrs. Fugit was with me until I was ready to handle what do I have here? What has he left me? First, my two girls, Leslie and Christina. He was, she was still in college at Harvard. Christina was in middle school. I have to be mother and father to them. So mm -hmm. that was first priority. Second, the business. I mean, sir, the book. The book of Mr. Lewis was unfinished. So we found it has to be written. It has to be published because I know people will be inspired by what he did with his life. And that's why should guys have all the fun. How Reginald Lewis created a billion dollar business empire. And I encourage you, if you haven't, if you haven't read it yet, please buy that book. And then the third was the company. The company was his life. That was his way to say to create wealth. And it was floundering. You know, I mean, it was going down. It was going to be bankrupt. So we started interviewing CEOs, but they were all white. I don't have anything about Caucasians, but we are known as a black company. But it's okay. They're all able. But they're asking a lot of money for salary. Right. And when I ask, ask them, you know, do you think you can make it successful? I'll try my best. Try your best. That's not good enough. If you try your best and it fails, oh, I tried my best. <laughs> no, 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 no. Take responsibility for yourself, Loida. So in December 22, 1993, after prayer, it was very clear in my mind. Take, take the company. Lead it. I mean, take over because we have 51%. And so we can tell the board of directors, elect me as chair. And I talked to Gene Fugit, who took over right after Mr. Lewis died. His brother, in spite of his grief, took over. And then when I was ready, he said, all right, at the uh, shareholders meeting, you become CEO. And that's how I took over. Why? Because I better say, if it fails, it's my fault. Rather than, oh, why did you do this? Why did you? You're pointing to somebody for failure. Three fingers are pointing at me. That's why it took over. And to take over a billion dollar enterprise that is floundering is no small job. It, even if it had been doing well, it wouldn't have been a small job, but it was floundering. And you came in and you describe in the book how you got the confidence of the leadership by just being straightforward and practical and making smart, practical, shrewd business decisions. But when you walked into that boardroom, was there any fear, any trepidation you had about having to face the board? Well, it was daunting, of course, but most of them are friends of Mr. Lewis and they knew me as Mrs. Lewis. That's number one. Number two, I know that I had a Filipino accent. So Butch Miley, who is my PR, said before that, okay, we will get a speech um, advisor. And so we went and I gave my speech and I was being videoed and she told me, all right, this and that and this and that, you know, read your speech over and over so that you don't read it all the time. You right. look and then you just glance at it. And then um, she, he brought me to a speech director because I would say that and this and, <laughs> you know, it's that and this <laughs> and that. Okay, so I had to prepare myself. So for all those out there, prepare yourself. That's it. Like, 
Don't be daunted by any challenge you have. You know, be prepared and then see where you're going. If you're going before a group of, you know, hotshot male executives, then be sure you look executive, that you you talk well, you don't say, ah, e, oh, ah, you know, you prepare yourself. And that's what they did. It was daunting, but I knew I could take it. And, I, and I'm not going to give away everything that's in the book. So we won't tell how you ran the business and what you did. I think, folks, you have to buy the book and read the book and you'll get some of that juicy detail. I want to go back for a moment to your early years when you were building your own career. Because as you said, your father had the vision for you to be a lawyer. He thought you would be a politician. You did become a lawyer and you worked in the space of helping people and in particular with immigration law. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, first, when we got married, before the children came, there was uh, an ad for legal services. Oh, I like that. So I applied because, you know, in the Black community, if the wife worked, that means the husband is not doing well. But Mr. Lumi said, I don't care. You want to work? Work. So I work with the El Barrio in East Harlem, where you, I thank God I spoke Spanish. So that's my first job. And then Leslie came and the uh, Supreme Court of the United States knocked down citizenship as a requirement for being for applying to take the bar exams. Now, the University of the Philippines College of Law is recognized in New York and several other states in the United States to be equal in study as a United States law school. So I didn't have to study law here in the United States, but I did take the bar exam, I mean, bar review. So during those three months, I had a baby, Leslie. I exiled her to Baltimore to mom because I want to be totally concentrated on studying. I didn't want to take the bar second time. And that's what I did. So I passed the bar. And then I wanted to be an immigration lawyer with the government. I applied and they didn't take me. I said, why not? I'm good. So I sued them for discrimination. And that was so I brave. I was. That was really brave. No, I, I mean, I want to be, you know, I know that I came from UP. That's equivalent of Harvard Law School. I was valedictorian in high school, cum laude in college, number seven in our graduating class of law students. So who, who, why would does that take, why did immigration not take me? Okay, something is wrong here. And the only way to find out is to sue them for discrimination. And I was right. <laughs> and, you, and you won and they gave you back pay. Three years back pay. There you go. <laughs> I mean, that is, look, everybody who's listening know that when you speak up for yourself, when you're willing to do that, it can count for something. And this wasn't the first time that you did that. You talk in the book about uh, the fact that Ferdinand Marcos was not the best uh, president, as it turned out. And you and your sister, she in the Philippines and you here in New York, really stood up and created publications to speak out against his regime and not without tremendous pushback and challenge. Can you talk about that? Yes. Well, my sister and I, my, my sister started with her friends an anti-Marcos anti publication called Imelda's Monthly. You know, the president Marcos' wife is Imelda and my sister's name is Imelda. So they had a spoof on Imelda, Imelda's Monthly. They were going to say, they were going to name it Ferdy's Organ, but there was, they had no friends who were Ferdinand, so they didn't. And uh, I said, I'll have a, a counterpart here in New York. And we continued and continued. And because, because of that, Melly went to prison when, right. Marcos, right. Uh, when Marcos declared martial law, she went to prison for six months. It was only with my father's intervention that he was able to get out unharmed. Thank God Papa knew the generals. So on my case here, we were blacklisted, meaning we cannot go back to the Philippines. And so that, will be, that for me was hard. So I asked Mr. Lewis, darling, can you go to the Philippine consulate and get some arrangement so that I can go back home? And he did. 
And so the arrangement is I will continue with my anti-martial law newspaper, but I will give space to the Philippine consulate for whatever propaganda they want to do, do there. And so I was able to go home. Yeah, um, that story as shared in your book is so rich. I want people to know that throughout this book, there's so many incredible stories, things that you can learn about American culture. You learn about Filipino culture, things that I think many Americans do not know. And a window also into the strong woman who you are and your family. It's just a beautiful story. So tell us again, what's the name of your book? Thank you. Yes, please. For those of you who have uh, who have the internet, Amazon.com order. Why should guys of all the fun how an Asian American an Asian American story of love, marriage, motherhood, and running a billion dollar empire? It's That's beautiful. It. Thank you. It's twenty eight dollars. It's twenty eight dollars. Please pre order it now. We, I, I spent the weekend reading your book and the stories are so, uh, it's so visual. So, you know, you really do take us into a lot of experiences, but you know, not many people take you into the experience of what marriage is like, what early marriage is like, you know, growing into what became a very wealthy life. Now it is true. You grew up in a very comfortable life in the Philippines. In fact, it was it was true that you had people who cooked for you and cleaned and all those things. And the, your early life didn't have that. You had to figure it out on your own. And that wasn't the easiest thing, was it? No, but, you know, Mr. Lewis knew, thank God, he came and visited and came to the Philippines where we got married. So he saw a little bit of that. And so part of the deal, my husband said, please send Noida here every year, Christmas time, after Christmas for the new year. That's one. And secondly, Mr. Lewis hired somebody to come and clean our one bedroom, fifth floor, walk up once every two weeks to come and clean. So in my mind, okay, fine. But, you know, it took you two hours to clean. This. But anyway, so that's how I adjusted to, and, and uh, he taught me how to do fried chicken. <laughs> Very important. But, now, you know, what was it like, what was it like when, you, you know, you evolved into having a tremendous amount of wealth. You talk about your beautiful palatial apartment in Paris and, you know, your home on Central Park West and in the Hamptons. I mean, growing from a relatively modest life to this incredible uh, expansive life, and that, that was a need for transition as well, wasn't it? Of course it was. You know, we had a three-bedroom vacation house in East Hampton, and that was fine, you know. That was great. And then when he bought Beatrice, Inter when he sold McCall Pattern Company and went into Beatrice International, he brought us to this palatial Georgian house in Amagansett, 27 rooms. Wow. And, you know, so huge. I was intimidated. And that's when he said, all right, we will have somebody who will clean, somebody who will be our chef and somebody who will drive. So, but it was intimidating. Even if I grew up comfortable in the Philippines, this is United States. Mm -hmm. So it was our, our, our home in Amagansett. We call it broad view because early in the morning, you can see the sunrise. And in the evening, you can look and see the Atlantic Ocean on the other side. So it was wonderful. You built a life with your husband here in the United States. You mentioned earlier about how he had to face racism at times. You were an interracial couple. And I can imagine there were times when you got criticism as a result of that. How did you weather that? <laughs> Actually, I never noticed. Really, really, honestly. I didn't say, okay, I'm Asian, he's American. I mean, he's Black American. No. He was my husband. I love him. And there was never, I really honestly, I, I, I don't look around. Are you looking at us because we're interracial? It never occurred to me. In fact, the only racism I got was at the supermarket when a white woman suddenly said, you chink. You know, I was really shocked. What? You know, you're do, throwing a racial slur. And then she accused me of inserting myself in the line. 
you know, I don't know what she was talking about because I thought I was just lining up. But between my being with him, really, we go to a, a party, all black, his, his you know, fraternity, Kappa Alpha Psi. I go to Baltimore. I really never, never in my mind acknowledge or be conscious, oh, we are interracial. No, 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 no. I'm with the man I love. So what, what has that got to, got to do? And what is anybody else's business? And this is what I try to tell other people. If you look for beauty, you'll find it. Mm. You look for discrimination, you'll find it. You'll for, you look for ugliness, you will find it. So have a positive outlook. Look at things, you know, the beauty of the world, the kindness of people, the love that you have for your, your spouse, the love that you have for your children. Of course, they can be also a pain, <laughs> but basically love, love, just love. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's, what's that song? Love makes the world go around. And that is truly it. So here's a question, you know, in, in recent years, there was this wave that got a name, the Stop Asian Hate Movement. You know, the, when with uh, uh, George Floyd's murder and then COVID-19 and there, this belief that all Asian people had brought COVID-19 to the United States, there was a lot of violence and also a lot of awareness. The awareness, I think, was good to try to help people to see each other differently. Uh, at, at that time, what what was your experience and were you able to support um, other Asian Americans during that period? Yes, and I attribute it to the previous President Trump for calling uh, Asian flu, you know, ch- uh, China flu, or, you know, he really just allowed a Pandora's box of hate and bigotry to be out in the open and to be, uh, that make it acceptable. So that I put uh, right there with this president. I don't want to mention his name. So how did I deal with it? Yes, we attended rallies. We called attention. My group, there's a lot, a few of us, um, called attention to the federal government, to uh, the to Biden, President Biden. Thank God he became president and did not give a second, and uh, you know, no second term for Trump. The local government here during the Blasio and now with um, uh, Mayor Joe and uh, Eric Adams. Eric Adams. So, yes, I have been, I have joined other group. I did not initiate it, but I have joined uh, the Asian groups, the Philippine American here in New York. And in terms of uh, the national, I am a member of the Asian American Pacific Islander Victory Fund. And mm-hmm. we just knocked down the, this congressman who called, um, who, who gave an Asian slur to Judy Chu, who has been questioning her loyalty. My God. Anyway, yes, hate is alive and well, and it is for us, people of goodwill, to fight it whenever we confront it. Well, you have helped out in many different ways with politicians to try to get messages across, really, in, in whatever way you can. I believe that a certain president you held a fundraiser for at your home. Who was that? <laughs> yes, yes. It was Leslie whom they called because Leslie was very active in President Obama's um, campaign. So she called, they called her and she said, mom, can we have it in your home? And so President Obama came and what did they do? They wanted to invite 60 people, sit down dinner. So they, they said, you don't have to do anything, Mrs. Lewis. So they took out everything, including the piano, the dining room, the living room. And they had in one place the greeting room where President Obama and mm-hmm. each one of the donors would take a, sh- a picture. And then they would wait when, in what used to be the dining room. That's their waiting place. And then for dinner, two long tables in our living room, 60 people sit down dinner. And that was uh, 19, uh, 2015. And we raised a lot of money for President Obama, for the Democratic Party, that is. That's right. And what's I know that you're going all over the country talking about your new book. And, and what's in the future for you, Ms. Lloyda Lewis? 
there's always something. And right now in the Philippines, President Biden would like to put up five new bases preparatory to whatever happens between China and Taiwan. But you know, in any base, in any foreign country where there is an American base, there is what they call collateral damage. There will always be children born out of a liaison between, you know, Filipino women and American servicemen. And then they would be the, they would be abandoned. So we are fighting for the rights, equal rights of these children, Americans, Pearlback called them Americans or Filipino Americans because their father is American. So we're fighting for them to be recognized as an American. For them, if they don't want to recognize, be supported until they turn 18. And for those who will not be recognized, who will not be supported and, and become an I mean, become an American citizen, but they don't want to bring them to the United States, a fund for their education. So that's my latest. That's my latest. Why? Because you know, being with an African American man, when I hear about these children of African American soldiers, they are really discriminated, and you know, they remain poor. They they are they are they are called the dust of the earth, and that's not right. Okay, these are children. They had no way. They had no. They did not decide to be born. And That's so right. I put it right in front of the American Defense Department to take care of the children that will be born. And maybe those who are already there and living very, very poor lives to fund, to have a fund for their education. Well, as always, you are not afraid to stand up for what is good and what is right. And we thank you for that. Congratulations on your book. And just thank you for sharing so much of your life with us. We really appreciate you and the work that you have done. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet, for allowing me another commercial interruption. Please pre-order the book, Why Should Guys Have All the Fun? An Asian American Story of Love, Marriage, Motherhood, and by <laughs> Running a Billion Dollar Empire. Oh, I forgot. I have a co-writer, and that is Blair Walker. And thank you, Blair for writing my story in such a readable way. Yeah, and he helped you to finish your husband's book. So it's, I, it's, not, it's, it's going full circle. Thank you so much, Miss Lloyda Lewis. Thank you, thank you, Harriet, for this. And thank you, everyone. Order the book now. Thank you. Well, what a pleasure to talk to Miss Lloyda Lewis. I think you need to order that book right now. Pre-order, let's sell this book as, as to as many people as we can, because the story is really wonderful. Thank you for joining me here on Dream Leapers with Harriet Cole. Until next time, have a great day and make it count. <laughs>